Everyone listening, welcome to the first episode of Jungle Talk, where we talk about everything in the CyberKongs universe, NFTs in general, DGen plays. Our first guest is Al, council member for CyberKong, Solidity Dev, very respected in the space. So Al, how are you? Hey, thank you so much for having me, Enzo. Uh, really happy to be here. And uh, hey, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Yeah, no problem at all. I'm guessing... It's been a pretty hectic past two months, past three months. How's it been? It's uh, This space doesn't let you rest. That's what I can say. There's way too much to do. And even if it's not out, uh, you know, on your project, uh, CyberCons here, for example, there's always something to think about or to fix or to kind of like uh, learn from outside. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is, there is way just too much. There is way too much to do here. No, definitely. It kind of feels like we're in a different time dimension sometimes when you're in NFTs. Yeah. You can either go insanely slow or insanely quick. But yeah, um, I definitely get that. So speaking of the space, when when did you kind of first hear of crypto? What year was it? How did you get into it? What was the first play? Kind of just talk us through that story. Right. So my first ever, uh, you know, interaction with blockchain was when I was a lot younger. I was uh, I was 14 back then, and I've heard people buying Bitcoin uh, pizzas with Bitcoin. So <laughs> that's that's technically how far it went. Uh, I never really did too much about it, sadly. Uh, I was just too focused on playing Pokemon or Super Smash Bros. Melee or something like that. Uh, but the true, the the actual one is uh, probably around 2016. Uh, uh, is it 2016? Yeah, 2016. Uh, I first thought, l- looked into Ethereum and everything, and just I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, I didn't look too much into it. And one year later, uh, I started to really get into it. A friend of mine gave me a lot of links to look into, understand what's blockchain, understand what are, what cryptocurrencies are, uh, what's mining. You know, the the bread and butter when it comes to kind of learning a blockchain 101. And eventually. Uh, Early 2018, this is when I pulled the trigger and, you know, I bought my first ETH and I started shopping around, getting some tokens, trying to be an ICO investor, as they called it. (laughs) And uh, this is what really started uh, my whole adventure in this new world. Do you remember the Ethereum price when you first bought in? Oh, it was bad. I bought in at like $1,300. It was it was going down. Like yeah. I, I bought in when it started to go down, like legit what I put in. Uh, the, the amount that I got at the end was like 90, uh, 10% of what I put in. It, it dropped it dropped by 90%. It was, it was crazy. I feel like that happened to a lot of people though. And then you kind of even make it out the other side or, or just give up on it, especially people that went through the whole euphoria of the 2017 bull run and then oh, the collapse yeah. of 2018. Yeah, I went in when it collapsed. And the best analogy is, is you know, Bane, when he's explaining how he was molded in darkness and he hasn't seen the light until he was a man. That's exactly how uh, going through the 2017, 2018, well, 2018 up to 2020 bear really was or felt I mean, it's, it's, it's literally that, like I had to cope so much, uh, at messaging people explaining like, why should I keep holding it? It's just so hard. Like I'm, I'm down so much. And, um, one of the person was, uh, was Coco, uh, Coco was really helpful, you know, helping me understand all those things and calming my nerves at first. Cause it was, it was really stressful. You know, I was, I just came out of uni and mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and, uh, you know, Telling your parents that you're down 90k on some money that you've earned on a, on, on a job is 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 not necessarily something you can say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so how did the relationship with Coco first come to fruition? How did you meet? Was it through Axie or? Yeah, yeah. So basically, at first, as I said, ICO buying some tokens. I bought like wrap tokens. Uh, oh, shit, I don't remember this. It was some bullish, uh, some project that Vitalik was super bullish on. I don't remember the, the name, sadly. Uh, 
I'll remember at some point, maybe later on. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm a big Reddit user, and eventually I saw Axie Infinity join the Discord, and literally two days after I joined the Discord, uh, I was I really enjoyed it, and I was looking to buy my few, my first Mystic. And then after my first Mystic, I was like, I need a double Mystic now. Like, this is, this is good. And uh, I bought my first double Mystic from Coco. So my first interaction with him was uh, me saying hi and asking him to give me a good price on the double Mystic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember you showed um, a few of the conversations in the CyberKongs Discord. And he's got a bizarre way of using uh, emojis on yeah. Coco, doesn't he? I should stop leaking. He was actually a bit cross <laughs> when I leaked, but at the end he was just laughing. But yeah, I, I should be a bit more conservative. But his emoji uh, usage over the years is definitely something that I was, uh, I am very privileged to experience. Uh, we went from emojis to rave pepes. Uh, we went to Ricardo's. Uh, we went to Harold's. And today it's a mix of Harold's and Kicks. The Kicks uh, are very powerful. The ultimate kick is Coco's favorite emoji right now. Yeah, yeah. I've experienced that myself a few times. Um, so kind of in, was it 2018 that you first spoke to Coco? Yep. So then how did that transpire to like first ever seeing the words CyberKongs, first seeing the gorilla profile pictures? Oh, wow. how, did, how did that all unfold? I mean, I'll, I'll condense because there, you, you can, there's so many stories and some of them are crazier than the others. But at first, um, so the, to give a bit of perspective here, so uh, I, I used to, st I studied mechanical engineering and I wanted to work as a mechanical engineer and I did find a job as a mechanical engineer, uh, but I quickly found that that's not what I wanted to do. And eventually I started looking into computer sciences and coding and I started to build games on Unity just to learn code and try to figure out if this is what I wanted to do. And uh, by learning Unity, you learn C Sharp, which was one, uh, one of those nice languages you can uh, start from. It's object-oriented programming and strongly typed, pretty solid if you want to start out. And uh, before joining the crypto world, I was just practicing and, you know, just trying to get better by building Discord bots. And uh, so after I joined Axie and I started speaking with Coco, a few times she was asking for, hey, can someone make a giveaway bot? Can someone do this? Can someone do that? And uh, I was always DMing him to say, hey, I can do it. I, I, I think I can. And uh, basically every time there was like a challenge or someone saying, oh, what if this existed? I asked myself, oh, that's a good idea. And instead of just stopping there, I would actually st tell to myself, do it. You know, there's nothing prevent you from doing it. And if anything, it's, it's what pushes up. And something you'll see at the end is the motto that I keep on telling people. It's learn by doing. This is my motto today. And that's, how, and that's what I keep on telling people when they ask me, hey, Al, what do you do? How should I start out? And it's like, well, learn by doing. You know, that's how I did it. And this is where I am today. And do, uh, do you yeah. Think there was a lot of overlap with your mechanical engineering degree to kind of first starting going into coding and going into solidity and all that kind of stuff? Not at all. Um, no. The curiosity maybe, but that's, that's prior to mechanical engineering. I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm happy. I'm actually okay to tell, say it today because, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in a better place and I don't have anything to prove to people anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, I failed my studies. Uh, you're 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 from the UK. I, I can assume by yeah. your accent, and uh, you probably understand this. I got a third class degree, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went to this job fair, you know, trying to find a job when I when I graduated. And uh, there was this. Uh, they were giving mock interviews, and so I kind of gave my background to the interviewer, and he said to myself straight out, third class degree. You're not going to be doing too much in your life." And I was like, oof, wow. that hurt. That hurt like deeply. And I was like, okay, well, I was feeling a bit down and I didn't know what to think. I, I stopped actually speaking with some of my uni friends because I was very ashamed to, not necessarily, I, you know, I tried to beautify what I was doing. You know, I had like a low level engineering job. Like it, it would, like, life was shit back then. Like, yeah. sorry if I curse, you probably might need to. Uh, no problem at all. Yeah, that's fine. But, but it was, it was, it was, uh, compared to today, it was, yeah, it was pretty bad, honestly. What, why, why, what do you think the reason was for kind of getting a poor degree 
um, um, level? I think I think uh, I, I would say it's, it's a mix of many things uh, today. You know, like people always say, oh, there's probably one reason, but uh, as Jordan Peterson says. Uh, usually those things are multivariable equations. So, uh, you know, th thinking today with the experience I have, I'll say that one, uh, I wasn't mature enough back then. I didn't have the consistency of being able to work the way that I am today. The second is, uh, while I love engineering and, you know, I love everything related to mechanical engineering, ma I mean, material design and all those things, which I still, you know, I'm cursed to this day. It's, uh, I think this is more of a curious hobby or just learning, you know, passion than anything else. And it was not something I was meant to work in. And the last one was also related to this idea of consistency and being immature is that I discovered League of Legends. <laughs> and yeah. I, was, I was spending way too much time playing than, than actually studying. So, you know, I was still pretty good at, you know, a bunch of design stuff. But when it came to actually passing the exams, uh, I would leave it to two days before to actually study. And uh, this works when you're a high school student. You can still get top grades. But um, at uni, uh, either you're a massive genius or, I mean... I'm not a massive genius, you know, I still need to, and I still need to take the time to do stuff. Uh, so I think those are kind of the main reason really. I, yeah. I think that's the learning experience at the end of the day though, isn't it? And that's kind of the problem with the corporate world and kind of like these massive banks or anything like that is that you can't really get a job there unless you have a two one from a Russell group university here or like an Ivy league university there. Yeah, but I mean that—that's not the beer on end door, and a lot of people are motivated and passionate to do what they want to do outside of getting a two-one um, with a degree from a Russell Group. And I don't know, which definitely what you've done in this space is an example of um, making it as opposed to what that guy said at the career fair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and as you said, you know, it's lucky because the the blockchain world is a completely new world. There's no standards. There's no rules. Everything has to be built from the ground up. And so there's this opportunity for people, especially in the dev world, where there's no direct impact on the skills you have. You can you can just learn, as I said, learn by doing because it's totally totally fine. If anything, it should be promoted to do it this way. But you know, uh, more traditional jobs like uh, you know being a surgeon or a doctor or a pilot or a civil engineer, sadly, you cannot learn by doing in those jobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, sir. Let me do my first brain operation on you today. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you think the main differences would be? Say you went and became a developer at a large multinational corporation like Google. I mean, how, how different would all the processes be compared to the freedom you have now? Uh, it's so hard to grasp because uh, after tasted the freedom of being able to work on multiple projects like we are today on most of those in, in most of Web3 and, and uh, DeFi and everything, it's, it's hard for me to actually be able to see myself in such a corporation, assuming I had the skills of a corporation like Google, for example, hiring me. Mm -hmm. I'd say that my mind is probably better off for coding in general. So had I studied CompSci early on, I would probably be a good dev today. Um, I th did, I th do you wish you did that instead of McAllen? Uh, no, Engineer, no, no, no. I, I, I try to live a life of no regrets. So mm. uh, I, I, when I was when I was eighteen and I got into engineering, it was my choice. So I fully accept it. If anything, I try not. I, I try to do stuff that I. So when there's a choice I have to do, like I'd rather do the choice that I won't regret. So even if it's a bad one, so that it just it just happens. I remember I, I mean this is this is probably getting personal, but who cares? But I did ask my crush at some point. Like I did say, like I did tell her about my my sentiments and everything towards her, and it didn't work out. <laughs> you know, it was it was a cringe moment. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know i don't regret it you know that's 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 how life is right <laughs> yeah yeah definitely that's another thing that like how, how much how much time goes into everything you do now because you work on multiple projects and they're pretty complex i mean how much time is there for holidays personal stuff like just so, friends yeah no i i do so it it it, it really depends on on uh on the scenario on the on the circumstances so with with plan collect on Cyberkongs, um, I had I had to do my taxes in the, at the same time. So mm -hmm. this was a very stressful time because uh, whatever little free time I had, it was to do my taxes. Uh, but in general, uh, I tried to keep good ethics of of work. Um, 
yeah, most of the day I'll be definitely working, but, uh, you know, ha, you know, I, when someone says, Hey, do you want to do this? And you want to go out and do whatever? Like I'll usually always say I can go because I'm very flexible. So I think that the, the default is beside the time I take for myself, whether it's, uh, you know, to exercise, work out, uh, you know, chill or something. If, if, uh, I don't have the opportunity to, to, to like interact with other people, uh, I'll just default to work because, uh, that's, that's the lucky thing. I don't really treat it as work. It's just projects that I'm doing. So, and because they're always different, it's, it's actually a lot better, more manageable than if you only have one project. That's also one of the reasons why I do multiple projects. You always change context and it can be a bit taxing for the first 10, 15 minutes to get into the, the newer project, but your creativity just is increased, uh, at least personally, because you you got you you have a new problem to solve a new angle, and overall it's it's you're stimulated much more than if you're doing the same job uh, over multiple days or weeks. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So through so in 2018 you met Coco. Fast forward, Cyber Kongs 2021 March 3rd. Did you see it when it released then, or was it after? So, um, let me, let me just, let me just, just before we go into several Kongs, uh, COVID happened and, yeah. and, and this is when I, I, I met this, uh, dev called Cliff Hall. He used to be the web dev for Avastars and a very, very knowledgeable, very experienced guy. And he, he said something to me that really, again, stood out cause it's like, okay, this is probably, he's probably the guy that pushed me to be where I am today. Mm-hmm. And he told me about you know, being a solidity dev and everything. And he said, become the biggest fish in the smallest pond. The idea being that become the best at something that's extremely niche, niche, sorry. And solidity dev is very niche. And so that's pretty much what I did. And I spent six months, 12 hours a day to code and learn how to write smart contracts. Uh, that's how I also, you know, founded YGG with Gabby and, and, you know, joined your finance for a bunch of projects. And, uh, going now to March, uh, to February, March, 2021, uh, my first, uh, interaction with CyberKongs was Coco telling me, oh, I just aped into this fun project. I bought a bunch of, uh, Kongs and I was like, what are they? <laughs> and he sent me the picture of all the Kongs and was like, oh, wow, they're, they're actually really nice. I wasn't expecting to actually like pixelated stuff. Uh, there's, um, it's not that I don't like CryptoPunks. I respect them as a project for sure, but it was never the type of art that I liked, but CyberKongs are, they have this coolness, you know, I have, yeah, I have Kongs 181, which is a Kong that has headphones and the rainbow shades. And he has this little smirk and I'm like, ah, the guy's way too cool. <laughs> and, uh, so, so, yeah. so what was your perception of the whole space in general? Uh, how much experience in NFTs before CyberKongs prior to that? So I did experiment a lot with NFTs in general. I, I did, you know, in, in my learnings, in my six month learning, I did a bunch of like, way, way, uh, how do you call that? Uh, rock, paper, scissor, wager type of games where you can like gamble NFTs and everything. And so I, I was pretty, pretty um, at ease, comfortable with the ERC-71 standard. And I was and actually back in summer 2020, I started thinking of the idea of yield generating assets, NFTs. And you saw that six months later, Hashmask was the first one. And I DM Coco telling him, look, the idea that I told you about six months ago, Hashmask is doing it right now. And I'm like, fuck, I should have, I should have, um, I should have done something. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so, so going back to Coco, he said, um, I want to help them. I think they have good potential. The community is nice. The art is nice and Mio is super nice. So I said, yeah, any, anything you want, Coco, you know, um, I, I, I truly respect Coco and, and, you know, I truly consider him as, as a friend for sure, but also as a mentor, cause without him, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so in general, if, if Coco asks me something in such a way, you, you know, the feeling, it's not like he tells me like daily, oh, build me this contract. I was like, well, sometimes you're like, I don't have the time, but in those specific scenarios, you, you know, that it's, it's just, it's a big deal. So you say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll help. And so at first he just wanted to tokenize, fractionalize Kongs. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll build it. I've already built something before. <laughs> 
And, uh, and, and at some point, you know, I figured this, uh, the hash mask uh, yield mechanics weren't efficient enough. So I thought of this new concept of, of attaching the yield to the address and not the tokens. And I proposed that to, to Coco. And he said, uh, and, and I said, maybe this could be applied to Kongs if we ever wanted to do a yield token for him, for them. And he said, let's do it. Let's, let's push the standard. So we, we started to uh, get in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a chat with Lexi, with, with Mio, with Coco. I think there was someone else. And I think it was Venstar, but I'm not too sure. I, I hope I'm not mistaken. I'm so sorry. This was a long time ago. And uh, I built the contracts. Uh, we built everything for the babies. Uh, the new yield mechanic with banana, and uh, this is uh, V1 Kongs for you here. Obviously, banana was April 17th that okay. the token was deployed. So, h- how long was it working on this? Was it straight after release, or when it started picking up traction? So, the banana token was an instant hit, I think, because uh, the way the way it happened. So, uh, we really we released the so so Kongs were an ERC one one five five token on the OpenSea asset store. Okay. So, we needed to do some uh, a bit of a reverse engineering to figure out how to get the correct tokens into NFTs. Um, once this was done, uh, we simply had to attach the yield token. And the breeding event uh, could start, and there's 4,000 babies, and uh, the migration went pretty fast at first, and uh, people were yeah starting to breed, and uh, I think it was an instant success straight up, straight up uh, because people got 300 bananas for each ascension. That's what we call the the term to move, to migrate. We just call it an ascension. And uh, everyone got 300 bananas, so they could, they could, if they, if you had two Kongs, you could breed one baby if you wanted to. So yeah, no, it was, it was, it worked instantly. And um, yeah, it was, it was a very fun experiment for sure, which further down the line, you know, inspired projects like, um, uh, was it uh, Anonymize, uh, Kaiju Kings, who are doing really well today, uh, and a bunch of other projects that are doing uh, token yields. Uh, I'm not telling, I'm not saying them cause I don't want to get the wrong word, but, uh, the name, uh, wrong, sorry. Yeah. Um, but well, yeah. why do you reckon, why do you reckon it was that there was so much success for Cybercons early on with banana, with breeding, do you reckon it was just kind of the innovation, something cool, the cool artwork, or do you think that it was more of a community sense or just multiple things coming together holistically? I think, yeah, again, multivariable analysis right here. I think the fact that uh, we're retaking, uh, you know, a, a tag that existed for a while, you know, breeding already started with CryptoKitties and, and Axie. Uh, the yield token was improved, so we had the more gas efficient way of pushing it. And the art was actually quite innovative in a way, like uh, Board Ape was actually, actually came later than us. Uh, there are pleased a different audience and ultimately was probably the, 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 the winner in this one. But uh, what is good about CyberKongs, I would say, is that, yeah, the, the growth of the community was very strong. The people that hold Kong assets in general are very happy to hold and the retention rate seems to be really good. Um, and, and which is, which is a good, which is a sign of a, you know, a very good community. Um, I'm not usually here to speak about prices cause, uh, it's, it's not what we focus on, but beside price or the retention rate, if anything is good, because that means that people trust the project and, uh, are happy to hold long-term. Yeah. Has it been like that? Cause obviously, I mean, it's quite elusive, pretty famous in the space, Wall Street Kongs has. Has the community kind of always been that kind of way since the very early days, or is, is, have you seen a massive change? Has it altered drastically, or is it still pretty similar? No, if anything, I think it's the same. <laughs> Actually, the only change is probably the the, the emote trends. <laughs> so <laughs> the keks now are have ascended. Now we have keck shades, we have rainbow keks, we have explosion keks, we have ultimate keks. I saw the new cube keck. Beside the things and the and the dua bands and whatever. I think, I think people are just, what, what, what I'm, what is really cool about the WSK is I have those vibes that I always see the same people. And this is what I truly love, even though there's 4,000 people that can like spam, but you know that that's it, that's 4,000. So it's, it's kind of okay because all the people here are, are just chill and in general, which is super nice. Uh, 
And, and this is one of the reasons why I love spending time on WSK and just trolling people. Cause at the end of the day, we all know that it's kind of, it's friendly banter. Like we're not trying to be mean. If anything, everyone's very helpful. There's always going to be a bit of, you know, uh, animosities from time to time, you know, that's, that's just human nature. But, uh, you know, as long as that's, you know, the minority of events, I'm very happy with how the community behaves and, and how they, how we interact with, uh, with them. It's, it's a lot of fun. I, I think it's very lighthearted in there. And I think everyone is kind of extremely benevolent. And I kind of think that filters down from the council. I mean, Coco basically epitomizes benevolence. And I mm-hmm. think everyone's super supportive of each other, very friendly. And it, yeah, it's just, it's just, it is a nice vibe in Wall Street Kongs yeah. and in the Cyber Kongs Discord in general. I truly agree. I'm, I'm an advocate of whatever you give, you'll get back tenfold. Mm. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of frustration with uh, the ape coin and people saying, why are they making it just because of VCs and everything? Uh, you know, we also felt that it's, it's almost like people are overlooking all the work we do. Uh, but at the same time, you can't overlook at the work that Bake are doing, uh, you know, and credits to them for being in their position. But, uh, you know, we, we've chosen a different path. Uh, and we know we learn from our mistakes, you know, that's stuff that we will be able to keep on pushing forward with, for example, advertising and then be able to, to push out Kongs further into the ecosystem. But I would never take back anything that we've done. And if anything, we have one of the, I I can't say, I I don't want to say we have the best community because, you know, I I haven't been in any uh, on all of the communities, but what I can say is I'm in a community where I feel very welcome. And, and for me, this is the best feeling. And if I feel welcome, I hope that the newer people can also feel the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the most, one of the biggest things that's come out recently has been play and collect. Obviously you must've worked on that for a while. Just how did the first concept of play and collect arise? And then how did it come to launch? It's, uh, this is hard. Um, because it's, it's kind of like a very foggy, very, uh, half remembered dream state. Mm. because, uh, I remember playing collect being, uh, thought of already sometime in fall 2021 and Coco telling me when you have time, sir, you know, have a thought and start building. And so, it was, yeah. So, so was this, was this your, your own fault? You thought gamified minting experience? Oh no, no. So who, who got the idea first? I want to say it was a group type of brainstorming session, but it could have been Coco, could have been Mio, could have been anyone. I don't think it's my idea. I think, uh, I think it's a, it's a group thing. I mean, most of Plan Collect today, a lot of the specs are, are, are group focused. I mean, on, on the way we found them. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I just remember Coco kind of like mentioning and giving me the specs in November and, and saying, Hey, we will need to, this to be built for December initially. <laughs> and I told him, this is, there is no way we can build this for December. <laughs> but for any, for any developers, how, how do you kind of, once you've brainstormed with the team, got the concept for playing collect, how do you even begin to sit down and write the first line of code and then get to the, the last line of code? Oh God, it's a, it's a very long process because uh, one of the bigger problems was that we wanted to make an on-chain game. And, uh, and we wanted like this energy system also, or a way to like lock things. And I kept on telling them we need staking or we do an off chain game. And they said, no off chain. So I was like, ah, so I need staking. But then people said we need staking, but it's going to be expensive. Cause at first we wanted to be on mainnet and mainnet uh, fees would have killed us. So we, so we then migrated to Polygon. Uh, we decided to migrate to Polygon. It was okay. But even then we, one of the one of the really longest things that took forever to figure out for playing collect was this idea of staking assets without losing ownership and it just came out of nowhere we know we were discussing with coco and he said we want staking without staking and as 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 weirdly as this uh sentence doesn't make much sense it it clicked something in my mind and i was like wait hold on hold on hold on and just I took maybe five minutes to think, think it out. And I said, what if we did this registry within the NFT and we just lock it like a mutex. So for non devs, a mutex is 
is basically uh, a piece of code that protects either an execution of logic or some data. Uh, the analogy would be, imagine you want to go into a toilet and there's a line to go to, to the toilet and one, when there's someone inside, uh, the door is locked, no one else can go inside. As soon as the person has done, uh, is done whatever they're doing, they unlock the door, get out, and then the next person on the line goes in, locks it, and uh, do whatever again they want. And the, the mutex is the lock on the door. It protects whatever people want to do. And uh, once it's unlocked, someone can go in. Uh, so that was basically the idea of the lock registry. And once it's, it's been thought out and built, uh, everything went a lot more smoothly and the design of the contracts uh, was at a steady pace. Uh, the lock registry was really the, the, the hardest uh, thing. Even though the gain logic itself is quite complex and there was a lot of improvements and gossip optimizations related to uh, bit shifts. We don't know, we need to go into details on this one. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you've lost me. Yeah, but uh, the it was it was pretty good. The the middle part of staking was what was the biggest hurdle for play and collect. Do you think the lot registry was kind of like an epiphany moment? A hundred percent. I think this is one of our this is one of our key uh, key innovations. In terms of the lot registry epiphany moment, how far do you think it can go evolve? Like, what what's the future of it? Oh man, like. Currently, there's there's potentially three uh, use cases I have, and so one of them is as 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 we've heard. Uh, I think that, I don't know if this is the best term to coin, but this the idea of stakeless staking. We, we've also need, seen non escrow contracts uh, for uh, and, and th- which is what Samurais call their their system, which is a bit more simple, the, which is simpler than the lock registry, but uh, serves a very similar um, uh, use case. Uh, but, uh, yeah, like actually if I can leak something very soon, so, uh, we're recording this on the 31st of March within the next potentially two, three, maybe up to four days, uh, we will be releasing a blog post explaining all the beauty of the log registry and, uh, a new contract that we call the guardian contract, which uh, people were kind of like, um, uh, they were calling it the 2FA contract. Yeah, this is big. For, any, for anyone that doesn't know, Al posted a tweet basically giving his private keys, which is rule 101 of what not to do in the NFT and crypto space, um, to five CyberKongs VXs. I think it was worth about 25 Ethereum, basically proving this locking mechanism, Guardian contract, if I'm right, Al. Yeah, that's correct. And actually, uh, people have been playing with that team and they've committed Kongium, and there's someone that managed to get five bananas out of it, <laughs> which is amazing. But, but like, what, what does this, because obviously there's a huge problem in the space. I mean, you see it every day, tragic stories of people getting hacked for millions sometimes. I mean, I mean, what does this mean going forward in terms of the space? That's the thing. It's very tragic. Like, there's been so many hacks of people saying they got their seed phrase compromised, that they've had, they were, uh, they, they, they've fallen for a phishing scam, uh, from some social engineering scam and all those things. And had, had the lock registry been, uh, part of the RC721 contract, uh, this would have saved so many thousands of dollars, if not millions. Because yeah. uh, it would have prevented people from losing their assets. Because the idea is that in conjunction of the lock registry, the Gordon contract allows people to lock their assets inside their wallets. And so uh, just to give an example, so you have all your assets on a hot wallet. Uh, the idea here is like you can, you, you, you have the convenience of not needing to click on your ledger all the time. You just click on MetaMask and, and confirm. And then you set a Guardian, which is a hardware wallet, and this hardware wallet can lock and unlock your assets. And once uh, they're locked, they cannot be moved. So even if you leaked your private key like I did, people would not be able to retrieve those assets. And what is cool is about that is that means that your assets inherit of the security of, the, of your hardware wallet while benefiting from the flexibility of a hot wallet, which is being able to do quick interactions on chain uh, via MetaMask or via script if you wanted to, and uh, which is amazing. You know, I, it, it seems 
it's 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 almost quite crazy that this tech hasn't been created until today. Like uh, there was actually a blog post today or today or yesterday about Avagachi pushing a very similar context, but they want to do rental, uh, which is another topic. And the lock registry, uh, the the purpose of the lock registry works extremely similarly to their rental system. So two different problems that arrive to the similar uh, uh, tech or, or, or uh, code, I would say. They... So no, it, it is definitely interesting and it, it proves to you that, you know, uh, good projects think alike, I would say, I hope, uh, I hope it, this is true and this won't age badly. <laughs> uh, but if people are starting to do it, then there, there must be something good about it. So, so when the assets are locked in the lock registry, is there any way for them to get compromised? No, no, no. Uh, there's, there's literally no way. You can safely retrieve them as well. The only requisite is that the uh, address where the assets reside we need to allow the guardian contract to move those assets out so you can unlock and transfer all in one transaction. We call that to be an atomic transaction. Uh, either everything goes through or nothing goes. And uh, this, will, this will allow people to safely retrieve assets if uh, their hot wallet would be compromised. And do you think there'll be widespread adoption of this soon? Or how do you think it will peter out? Well, I, I think it would make sense. At the end of the day, we don't control what people do, but I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll definitely be an advocate of newer projects uh, to, to adopt this uh, standard because it doesn't add much gas usage on transfers. There's only one more check uh, of storage, which is very negligible over the transfer costs if it also allows people to protect their assets in a, a way better uh, sorry, if, if they can protect their assets in a much uh, with a better system and better security. So for me, this is a clearly a net positive for everyone that's uh, you know considering using this this standard. Um, going back to what I said earlier, there's going to be a Medium article, but also uh, there's going to be two uh, GitHub repos with the codes uh, in a, in a standard uh, contract implementation with unit tests, a readme explaining how it works. And the version, so people will be able to safely uh, implement them within their brownie or hard hat uh, setups when they're building smart contracts. Wow, that's yeah, that's pretty insane. How, how long did all did all this take to work on? The 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 the, the guardian contracts. Yeah, it's funnily enough. Uh, the way it all started was once Plan Collect was released, first day. Uh, I went to bed at some point. I don't know when, <laughs> but uh, when I woke up, people were saying how a user got their private key compromised and the hacker extracted all their assets out of their wallet. Yeah. However, they were not able to retrieve the VX assets because they were uh, locked up into the adventure contract and the hacker was, uh, didn't, wasn't tech savvy enough to understand how to unlock them simply because, uh, you know, they're, they're also working with time and they're trying to extract everything as fast as possible and understanding how the adventure worked. If they were not aware of what cybercons were, uh, they would have not been able to do it. And uh, because of this, it, it bought the, users, the user who got compromised enough time to safely unlock those assets and then say, send them to a wallet that they controlled. And uh, I thought this was a fantastic story because it, it shows to you how the lock registry is so powerful. And from this incident, uh, I started working on this guardian contract. I've perfected it a bit. And uh, currently with uh, the help of a good friend of mine called Gaspacho, he's also a dev that I work with a lot, very talented person. He's building the web app and we're very, su very close to releasing uh, the tool to the world, as I said, alongside the blog post explaining how everything works. Cool. Yeah, that's very cool. I do remember seeing that actually, and I kind of thought it was pretty insane because literally every asset got wiped apart from the VXs, wasn't it? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. I mean, that, I mean, it kind of just shows the innovation of of playing collect and as a whole. But aside from the lock registry and guardian contract, how do you think playing collect's been received? How do, you think, how do you think it's been? I think it's been very positive. Uh, we've definitely been... Uh, the, the trends of usage and how many runs are being done per day 
has been uh, a lot higher than what we've anticipated, which is surprising, but it's a, a very happy surprise. Yeah, I was going to say it must have exceeded expectations when uh-huh. you saw the total banana prize pool from, from season one. Oh, a hundred percent. We were expecting, uh, I don't know, something like 20,000 runs over the first, uh, first five days or something. <laughs> and but for anyone that doesn't know what playing collect is, I'd say you're the man to explain it. God, th- this is going to be a hard one, but basically, uh, the, a play collect is a new on-chain experience for Cyberkong's VX holders they can log their VX into teams that they can send into adventures and play some gamified uh, game. Sorry, and they can just participate to this gamified game where their VX can return with experience points and loot, which would allow them to get uh, more items uh, and, and, and assets within the CyberCons collection. Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good summary. I'm pretty bad with summaries. Uh, I think I think inverted would have been a lot better for this one. <laughs> where 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 do you see it going forward? Playing collect. Oh, Obviously, we're still in infancy stage at the There's moment. There's so much. So I I already have so many ideas of how plan collect can evolve into. So this is just a prototype or V zero. I don't even think this is a V one because this mm. is just a, a new a new way of of gamified you know uh, emission. And and the the purpose of playing collect serves is is so is so big. Like you can use it to give whitelist. You can use it to, uh, you know, distribute a new collection. You can use it to distribute, you know, a partnership token. You can use it to just be involved within the Kong's ecosystem. You know, there's going to be crafting at some point, and you know, playing collect is going to be the method used to distribute those craft materials to everyone. But yeah. not only that, the playing collect. Uh, experience as we as we know it today is just the first iteration and it will evolve it will be a bit more complex it will you know for example weapons are starting to be uh, uh, you know discovered right now who says that playing collect won't allow you to have those weapons equipped for example and and also here's another leak for you guys what if playing collect was a totally totally new game what if it's not adventures what if it was something else uh, i mean the possibilities are really, really endless. And there's one thing I'm going to be working soon on, which is another version of Plane Collect, a totally different game, a totally different gamified way of collecting things. It'll potentially be more interactive. And, and this is super exciting. You know, this is the type of things where it's, it's also a challenge because making games on chain is very hard. Uh, you know, I don't think the EVM is a very good game server. But it's always good to actually try it out, see what we can do. And uh, yeah, like, there you go. I mean... No, I, I think there's, there's some cool points there and the future's bright. I think, I mean, you touched on it. There's a massive issue when you think about the current paradigm of supply allocation and NFTs, like AK okay, whitelist spots. I mean, it's kind of encouraged a bit of a toxic um, effort code amongst young people in terms of just sitting on Discord for eight hours a day, uh, purely for monetary incentive. Do you think potentially play and collect as like a gamified minting experience is kind of could potentially alter that paradigm in the future? Yes. If anything, if anything, this new minting experience is one of the many possible uses of play and collect. As I said earlier, I mean, it's just not minting. It's just so much more. It can be. It can also be just a very fun game. It can also be a way to to give out, you know, new tokens. It's 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 basically an engaged way to distribute stuff to people. Like if yeah. they're participating, they get stuff. So it's not just minting. Uh, but yeah, definitely one of the reasons why we wanted to push play and collect. Yeah, because it's, it's active engagement that's enjoyable, and you get rewards at the end of it. Yeah, that's that, correct. Yeah, basically. So, I mean, people can speculate all they want about when the next CyberCon's collection is, but I'd assume it would be launched through Play and Collect. It would be. It would actually be a mix uh, because having it all through Play and Collect is very restrictive. Uh, you know, if we push a new collection, it's also one of the reasons we would do that is to actually enable new users to join our ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And we, of course, always will want to reward our most, uh, you know, diehard fans and, 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 you know, community members involved since day one. 
and uh, doing so, it makes sense to you know allow people to you know participate and 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 earn mint uh, rights within the play and collect experience. However, we will also have you know whitelist for people who are joining the Discord and everything. We will also also potentially have a public sale. And we also have a gas war, you know, a bit, a bit of everything. I, I, I think it makes sense to serve a bit of all crowds. And, uh, of course, things will change based on, you know, popularity and, and how much audience we have to, to mint this, this new experience. But um, I don't want to spoil too much on how we want to do it. I still think we want to make it a surprise because there's so many game changers here. And uh, I don't want to leak too much on this one. Uh, but I, so this is just for you, Enzo, because uh, I think it's nice to, to hear. But for the mint, for the public mint, to prevent gas wars, there's a function in Solidity that allows you to check how much the gas price is when you execute the function. And so what you could do is that on, on the function, you can say, if the gas price is superior to, say, 100 guay, you revert. So this is an anti-gas word type of sale where we want people to be patiently waiting until the gas congestion is gone and people can mint sub 100. So this almost becomes like a lottery system and uh, and whose transaction gets pulled by the miner. So uh, I'd, this, I'd say it's going to get interesting. It is, right? Collection launch then, yeah. It is, right. So anti-gas word, there's going to be public minting. Uh, there's going to be a gas rush for sure. There's going to be whitelist. There's going to be play and collect, a gamified exper- experience. So all those things come in, and uh, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. It's, it's going to be interesting when it happens. I think that's cool, though, involving like the whole ecosystem for a collection launch, as opposed to just going on a website and clicking a button. Yeah, fuck that, man. That's so fucking boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, but I mean, play and collect changes every season with different rewards. Um, it doesn't even just have to be a new Cybergun collection. You can you can do multiple things. But what I wanted to know is, would it ever be possible to include NFTs from other projects inside Play and Collect Rewards? Is that is that possible in any way? That is 100% possible. It is? Yes. Yeah, because I've seen a few people speculating that could be the case and it would be a pretty cool concept if it happened. More coming soon. <laughs> there you go. It's just exclusive for Jungle Talk. Hey. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, overall, just the NFT space, how, how do, what do you think of it? How do you see it going forward, current trends? So there's, I'm torn because there's, uh, there's amazing things and there's very bad things. There's amazing things because when I, whenever I see people pushing the, the industry forward, it, it, it's, that's what pushes me to want to do better. Um, you know, there's, there's so many projects out there who are always trying to push and, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing because this, this is what drives innovation. Competition drives innovation. And that's, that's something that I love. And I also love to see how people are engaged with their communities, um, which is amazing. The other side of the coin, which makes me sad of the NFT space as well is, um, the fact that people a lot of people, and, and but that's just something I need to cope with, is that uh, people are a lot here for the money, or sorry, are a lot here for the money, and also uh, they'll be gullible to uh, a dream. So it's good to sell a dream, but it's also good to prove that you can make it. And I, I want to emphasize this one. Uh, I'm not, and and I usually don't call people out. And uh, and I'm not here. I'm not saying that the team isn't is is bad, but I want I want to touch on the Pixelmon incident. So Pixelmon raised 70 million to create a very ambitious project really uh, around uh, you know a Pokemon esque uh, world and made it out of voxels. And the you know the the pictures and the how how do you call uh, you know the the the, the trailer ch- yeah the trailer sorry amazing trailers and all those things they, they released a demo i think which yeah. received a lot of people and and the te- and the demo sold it right and when they released it boy oh the memes that came out of it and they what, ha- the actual collection yeah it was terrible yeah. it was terrible uh, there's a meme about kevin which looks like a, a small zombie and and just overall the audacity of the devs to actually use uh, unity assets from the asset store 
that costs like 170 bucks is outrageous. Mm. And, and to me, and, and maybe the devs truly want to make something out of it, but, uh, you know, and I, and I'm not here to start a witch hunt or anything, but it's just that the fact that they raised so much and they yet still pushed a reveal that is something that I could have done alone in, in two hours, you know, of, 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 uh, I don't know. It's just, I think how, it's, it's how so would bad. You prevent it? I mean, because there's a lot of people and probably young people and you got to think about some of the stories. I mean, free ETH is a hell of a lot of money to a lot of people. Some yeah. people could have started with a hundred dollars, all that grinding to get to free ETH had faith and trust in the team, the project. And then they spend, I think it was $9,000 at the time. And then, and then that happens. I mean, there's probably quite a lot of devastation. Well, there's loads of devastation that's just come from that one project. So how do you kind of prevent it going forward? Or is that just part of the space being no, in, no, no. in an infancy stage? There's, it's, it's, yes, but there should definitely be stuff done to prevent it. And so, you know, one of the things is, uh, you know, when new projects come out, I always talk about trust and reputation. Um, and, and that's one of the things. If, an, uh, if, if a known user, and I'm not, I'm not talking about influencers, because influencers are, are here also to pump their own bags. And I'm sorry, yeah. there must be some truly great influencers out there, amazing content creators. But a lot of them also are just there to pump their bags. You know, uh, maybe I'll, I'll be called out on this one. No, uh, that, that, was, that was 100% one of the problems. I mean, yeah. there, there were some influencers reacting put, live to the demo yeah and then uh, and then there was also people like i remember uh, uh andrew steinwald steinwald i'm so sorry andrew if i'm pronouncing your your name wrongly uh but he did say it's very suspicious how they managed to raise 70 million just on the trailer and he was right and this goes to sh to prove that you want you want devs actual devs and and builders of the industry to vet and approve a contract uh, sorry, approve a project. Had you know people like I don't know, Axie said Pixelmon is an amazing concept. You should guys, you should check them out. This gives a lot of credibility, and and this goes back to what I was saying: trust and reputation in this space are worth a lot. And I also want to share this little experiment, this little project, side project that I've done in the past few days. Uh, basically, as you've all seen, uh, Board Ape has released their token, and they were allowed to enable allow people who hold who held Ape uh, assets, mutants, to collect uh, Ape coins uh, out of uh, just claim them. Uh, but the dogs needed to be matched with a with a nape or a mutant, and so. Uh, I saw a tweet of Nate Alex saying there should be a tool that did this, that that did this, and so I built it with Gaspacho. We had the web app, and once it was released, uh, we tried to push it, uh, but because we were n we both were no community members of the whole Bake ecosystem, uh, we didn't have any trust, we didn't have any rep reputation, and so what I did was to contact some of the, my Bake friends and telling them, hey, please retweet my my tweet about this tool, uh, try to get the word out, you know, try to say, hey, I know Al, he's a great dev, you know, secu in security wise, he's always, he's always got it. I went as far as to actually DMing OX Quit, Quit, mm -hmm. who is apparently an extremely well-known dev within the Bake ecosystem, yeah. who eventually vetted our contract. And he said, yeah, their, their contract is safe. I, I definitely 100% support uh, using it because, uh, you know, support the builders and, and basically every project that should, you know, that is legit should go through this. They should try to get the word out to some trusted members and say, Hey, we're building this. Can you help us out to, and, and of course, you know, those devs need to, but th this is hard as well because then it, it comes to the, to also the, the, re the, re oh, shit, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so the, the only caveat here as well is that the reputation of the person also vouching is on the line, but that's, that's the point. If the project is really good, then the person will vouch a, a, more easily than if they were not. So you think there needs to be a kind of audit function system? So it's, it's not, but... it's not an audit function, but as I said, it's all about trust and reputation. And of course, you know, if pick someone, imagine had they had they actually been legit and they were it started and it was really good uh, but eventually two years down the line they would have failed 
is different because at least they show that they tried, right? And, and this is totally different. I'm just saying from the get-go, like clearly pick someone, I don't know what they're doing now. They have sent a million, but clearly I'm, they're probably building and, and great if they are. But the whole point is their, their stunts should have never happened. And, and those things don't happen with the reputation. Another good example is cyber brokers. It's Josie that built it. Josie had extremely good reputation before and it showed their project is amazing, is doing incredibly well. And, and there's no rug pull, no disappointments. And this is all because of trust and reputation. So do you, do you find it bittersweet that there's projects that have released since October that have pulled in sums like 70 million and Cybercongs have never even been close to dealing with that much? Um, with the development work, it's uh, I don't I don't think it's a bitter uh, sensation because uh, we 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 never tried to raise this much. We never had a collection worth three ETH, and I don't think it's something we want to do uh, for now. Maybe in the future, if it makes sense, we will do bigger raises because maybe our vision will scale a lot more. But currently, with what we have, uh, you know, we're still making innovative uh, stuff. On the tech side, uh, our brand is slowly, uh, you know, growing, and and that's something that we're trying to push even further. So uh, it's not better for sure. It's just uh, how we want to do it. And um, then again, maybe I'm not too sure because I only and I only focus on the tech side when it comes to actually decisions on the marketing and and how we want to move forward. I don't necessarily. I'm the one that protects too much in those decisions because uh, I just I just want to build right now. My my mind is on building and uh, yeah, completely. It was it was just more of a activation to what you could build with something like that. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's point. it's possible, but you know when when people receive this amount of money, they become even more liable. Uh, right now, we we are not this liable because the prices at, at and again, I don't like talking about prices, but you know the raises that we've done on when we sold assets are just you know in in the millions. Like uh, I think we raised maybe one one million for the VX uh, private uh, for the sale, sorry, which is very much acceptable mm -hmm. compared to what they're worth today. And again, I don't want to talk about it, but the whole point is, I do believe that we've added a lot more value than, than we've started. So, and, and, and just, just to be even more clear, uh, the Kongs, the Genesis Kongs, they were sold 0.1 ETH, 0.01 ETH. Yeah, 0 0.01. And, and the legendary auction, I think Mio sent half to some, to the, uh, to some foundation, yeah. uh, some, to some charity. So, you know, that, that's a, that's another problem that we're trying to figure. Like, should should council get paid and incentivized? I always say that we're incentivized because we have we hold assets, but uh, maybe this isn't enough because you know a lot of those people. Uh, I'm not talking about myself, but a lot of of the council members are doing so much work, and and sometimes I feel they should be rewarded because they're they're pushing out so much work and trying to you know do innovative th innovative things in the in the tough space, uh, you know. Maybe maybe there should be, but again, this this opens up a new kind of cans of worm, yeah, new kind of worms, I mean, and it's hard to actually answer and, and give you a correct answer here. There's no right or wrong; it's just how we want to approach it. No, definitely. I, I think there's, yeah, so many issues within the space at the moment that kind of are just going to develop with time. I suppose. I mean, I think people learn a lot from Pixelmon to not ape in based off hype alone and. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you have any predictions where you see NFTs in five years' time? Will it still be PFPs, all that kind of stuff, or do you think it would change drastically? Oh, I think uh, I would. I would say that if I if I would to uh, if I were to do a, a, a friendly bet, I would I would definitely think that we would evolve from PFPs. Uh, so so PFP concept would probably stay because it's, it's a social status. Mm -hmm. But but the package of a project would be much larger than what it is today. Uh, today, there's still a lot of just, it's just a profile picture. And then this is what we intend on building. But the intention, as, as, as loud and ambitious as you are, uh, you know, you got to prove that you can do it. And, and once again, it goes back to what I was saying about trust and reputation. Uh, you know, if we, if we did ever start a, another project or a new collection within the ecosystem, 
people would be a lot more inclined, I would say, to get into our uh, into the sale simply because we've proven that we can actually build and that we can actually deliver and that we can actually over that we try to over deliver if anything. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it all goes back down to trust and reputation, which is crazy in a decentralized w- world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all just a bit crazy really, isn't it? Mm. Um, I think you've changed much kind of personally since joining cyber Kongs since being a dev since the days of getting rejected at the um, career fair. <laughs> yeah, it's been a wild one. It's, it's been a very, uh, a, a very interesting ascension, and uh, not only on the dev side, but on the philosophical side as well. There's been a lot of changes in my life that allowed uh, me to be who I am today and accept who I am and for the better. I mean, uh, I feel like, I approach life in a, in a much better way than I did a couple of years back. I was going to say, do you feel more free now? Because when you come out of university and you kind of, most people are thrown into the corporate world, there's a severe sense of being trapped in a way. Yeah. The, the web three world is very free. People allow you to do what you want, which is something that is amazing. In corporate uh, structures, you're only allowed to work on one job and that's it. Well, Web3, no one prevents you from doing anything. I actually hate the word employment or working for. And now I prefer the idea of contribution and, and being a contributor within an ecosystem. Uh, I don't work for CyberKongs. I contribute for CyberKongs. And that's something that I, that I say in general. Like, I, don't, I don't like the term working anymore. I think it's, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go with the idea of what Web3 and uh, uh, decentralized work uh, represents. Yeah, yeah, I like that mindset. If, for people wanting to get to that kind of mindset, that I don't know, perhaps they want to get into Solidity, want to get into coding, smart contracts, but like they know nothing about it. What what would be the advice? Um, yeah, start reading online. Google is so 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 easy. It's the biggest encyclopedia you have, and uh, probably start with CryptoZombie. It's always a very good uh, you know way to learn Solidity. Um, but yeah, documentation, reading it, uh, reading contracts on on EtherScan, understanding how they work, starting coding your own implementations. You know, those are the things that I did that allowed me, and I started from nothing. You know, Solidity was a, was a language I didn't know back then. And, and this, once again, goes back to what I was saying earlier on. Learn by doing. Uh, the more you do, the more you learn. And the more you learn, the more comfortable you become in the area that you're trying to get better at. And it's this positive feedback cycle where instead of being in the endless spiral of, of the nether, it's the other way. It's, the, it's of ascension because everything goes hand in hand and it, 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 it enhances and uh, makes your quality of work a lot better. And this isn't just dev advice. This is just general life advice. Yeah, it just suits, so. it suits Solidity really well because Solidity is such a hard... It's not a hard language, but, get, get, uh, you know, Solidity is... Being a smart contract dev isn't just about coding. It's, it's about confidence. It's about being able to push a system out and being sure via unit testing and via thorough, you know, auditing and reviewing that your code is safe and that there is no way to have catastrophic uh, failures. And that's something that's very hard for newer devs to accept because you know, newer people, apprentices and, and, and juniors, they will, they, will, they, will, they will fail, but that's, no, that's, not, that's okay. You know? Failure is part of the process to become good. It's just that in an environment where there potentially could be millions on the line, if you do one mistake, it can be very catastrophic. And I, I, I you know, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to steer. Uh, no, sorry, I don't want to open, you know, wounds, fresh wounds. But you know, hacks happen when, uh, you know, at any given time, and you know, millions, if not hundreds of millions, can be can be removed from a system, and you know, that can be very scary for devs. Yeah, I mean, when you contextualize it like that, it's actually quite astonishing how much pressure is truly on devs and how many precautions need to go into into all work so i mean kudos to you and everyone else working in the space i, I, I found it very inspiring personally 
And we've also hit the hour mark, so I just wanted to say a massive thank you, Al, for coming on the first episode of Jungle Talk. Really appreciated your time. I'm sure a lot of people will find what you've said really insightful, really inspirational. And yeah, I appreciate Al. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great uh, speaking with you. Uh, I'd be happy to you know, come back whenever you want. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. And I'll see you guys next time. Stay safe. Yeah, definitely. Cheers out. Sorry.